Castor Boyle has been the biggest climate resistance campaign in the UK for several years. Thousands of people have been arrested. Hundreds of people have already been put in prison. New legislation came in to attempt to stop this agitation. And for that reason, they started giving people three, four, five-year sentences. But I look upon it in a positive sense that, as Gandhi said, you go to the fight stage before you go to the win stage. And we know historically that's always the case. It's really a matter of attrition, as you might say, over the next few years until we finally push these regimes into some sort of shape or replace them. If we are going to decarbonise to the extent that is objectively necessary to prevent social breakdown in the coming two decades, then we are inevitably attacking the heart of the capitalist system broadly defined. And we all know that if you substantially challenge the powers that be, then they will use all available means to respond to that. And as well as repression, then they will manipulate the public sphere to the extent that climate change, as you call it, you know, doesn't get talked about or doesn't get mentioned in courts and in any other public sphere. And of course, it should be added that the phrase climate change itself is a duping sort of (laughs) phrase which was dreamed up by PR advisors to fossil fuel companies so that it distracts us from what is really going on, which is the extraction of resources by the global elites. And the global elites are involved in a universal suicide project for humankind. We don't need to talk about the climate and we don't need to talk about change. What we need to talk about is power and criminality and evil. What we're talking about is a death project and that's what we should call it. This is the usual routine of right-wing popularism, isn't it? Is to take you up the left and, and use it as a sort of smokescreen for the continued extraction of power and resources by the billionaire class. Really, I think the important point here is the failure of the left to connect with working classes around the Western world and promote their concerns and recognise their situations rather than continuing to complain to each other in various university-educated intellectual silos, as you might say. We've only got ourselves to blame, really, and people have been making this point for a good 10 or 20 years now, and really Trump is the consequence of the progressive space not taking working-class perspectives seriously, and it's a massive error. And it happened, of course, in the 1930s and the 1920s. So... It's all systems go, really, as far as I'm concerned, to create assembly movements, for instance, that can reconnect with local communities and empower those communities to get what they really want, which is acknowledgement and and real democratic power. And if we don't provide that opportunity, then they will go to sort of fascist rhetoric like they are doing all across the Western world at the moment. The way that democracies are controlled is a lot bigger situation than simply oil. That said, of course, we can say, oh, the fossil fuel companies have massive structural power, and that's no doubt the case. However, that's not the real problem here. The real problem is the very structure of what we call democracy, which enables elites to interfere before elections during elections and after elections, because we have a representational voting system, which, as you all know, was evolved in the US after the War of Independence to exclude the common people from participation in the political process and to favour and support the elites. So we've never had proper democracy and proper democracy going back to ancient Athens and such like is actually people being selected randomly by sortition so that the powers that be cannot interfere with who actually gets to rule. And ordinary people rule 
rather than people selected by political parties. So I think we need, given the extremity of the crisis we're in, we're not in some run-of-the-mill, you know, democracy versus the elite situation. What we're in is a complete crisis of the whole basis of how we make decisions um, and the short-termism and the irrationality and immorality of those decisions. And that's a function of of how we actually make those decisions. So there's a lot of thinking to be done, right? (laughs) I'm not saying I've got all the answers sitting here, you know, in the prison cell, but this is something that needs to be thought about, not least, of course, in the United States, where, as everyone knows, the, the process is completely sewn up by the elites. I don't think we should fetishize the act of resistance in the sense that isn't it terrible? The powers that be will put people in prison. I mean, there's a tendency to do that. And some people have done that to the dozens of people that are in prison in the UK. We're not in prison because we want to complain about being in prison. Being in prison is part of the process of political change. It always has. It always will be. The powers that be will always put people into prison and do worse things to people in order to hold on to their power. What we need to like strategically focus on is how do we increase our own power in the face of that repression and that's to do with how we frame things not in a defeatist way of oh isn't it terrible they've done this so we should all be self-pitying what you should be saying is good they're imprisoning people good it means they're on the back foot how do we increase our power how do we enable communities to gather together in assemblies and connect with the big like objective struggles that we see over the next 10 years, over inequality, uh, over the climate and such like. And that's the work that we should be doing. And I think like the radical media should be focusing practically on pathways towards creating mass movements, which we've miserably failed to do over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, sustainable organisations a bit like what happened before the neoliberal period with the unions, with the civil rights struggles, where there were proper structures, proper leadership, functional hierarchies. You know, we haven't got time to just be miserable about, you know, what is inevitable. You know, obviously I can only speak for myself, but I certainly know other people in the UK would like to make that clear as well, right? We don't want to be put on a pedestal. We want the people that listen to this to get off their arses, look at the literature, get together, make smart collective decisions and actually create a mass movement. Not least, as I say, in America where, you know, whatever we do in the rest of the world, we're fucked unless America comes up trumps. (laughs) Not to use an unfortunate word there, but hopefully you see what I'm trying to say. Well, what I'd say to that is you don't exist to do what you want in life, right? That's a neoliberal reactionary perspective. If it's not worth it, I'm not going to do it. That's how capitalists think. If you want to think in terms of the great traditions of solidarity, the indigenous wisdoms of the world, it's not about you. It being about you is, is about as reactionary an attitude as you can construct If we're going to live lives we're going to actually be proud of when we come to the end of this life, then we're going to resist because it's right to resist. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, the main determinant of the success of social struggle is when people resist because it's the right thing to do, not because they're trying to work out whether they get a return on their investment. It's like the worst elements of neoliberal accountancy culture to think that, hey, I'm not going to go on a demonstration because it's not worth it. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, it's like the end of the world. Do your duty. You know, all those people that died in past generations, they didn't die in past generations for you to go, oh, what the fuck? You know, it's not worth it anymore because we're all going to die. You know, there's nothing more obscene. And, and this is the problem that we promote this utilitarian, you know, me first sort of attitude on the left. And we've just been colonized by the right-wing ways of thinking, 
What we need to do is connect with our traditions and the glory of going out and saying, no fucking way. You know what I mean? Not on my shift, over my dead body. And then, you know, fate will determine what happens. And that, that's the glorious thing about what we're doing. It's enjoying our life. It's living our life as if our life counts, not trying to make calculations on whether we're going to be successful. That's ridiculous. I don't want to say this to try and get ideological brownie points or whatever, but the fact of the matter is there's nothing enormously brave about me, right? I'm in prison with, you know, life is along my corridor. In every prison, there's hundreds of guys who are total heroes because the life that they've had to be put up with and the injustice that they've had to deal with. And I'm not saying that because they're all great guys, right? Obviously, many of them have done objectively really bad things. But the point is, is the whole of life is an act of heroism. You know, you're going to be dead at some point. You know, it's difficult. Life is difficult for everyone. So obviously, it's a cool thing to do, to resist. And if you get put into prison, it's nice for people to support you. Don't get me wrong. But we can't fetishize people that are being in prison. They're doing the job, and we need to do Everyone needs to do their job and get on and do this resistance. So that's the first thing. <laughs> the second thing is in terms of inspirations. I honestly can't think of someone who stands out apart from, you know, obvious people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all that sort of stuff. What I feel inspired by is the organization I'm in, just to boil an umbrella, because it's basically full of amazing people who have put their egos behind them and act in service. I mean, obviously, every organization has its problems, but it is a wonderful organization to be in. And what it shows is if we do come together in that sense of humility and service, we can create large-scale organizations, and that's what we need. We need to inspire each other rather than have some big guy in history that thinks great. I mean, obviously, it's great to know there's been great guys in history and wonderful people in various resistance struggles. There's no question about that. But I would invite people to be inspired by each other. You just those little things we do for each other to help each other out, turn up on the day, you know, do the crappy jobs that no one gets no one gets support for, collecting people from police stations, going to do leafleting, dealing with conflicts. All these things are the real moments of heroism in my view. And obviously that's how I see it anyway. There's no question, dare I say it, that there's going to need to be earth repair like investments and geoengineering because we're in an objective situation, right? Nature is not a political construction. It is what it is. If you have cancer, you go and have surgery or you die. It's not like you can complain about that sort of thing. And the objective situation, as I understand it, and if I'm wrong, I'm more than happy to be wrong, but I have a team of people who work with me, you know, on the science, and I do a lot of science communication, as you might say. I don't actually use the word science because that's problematic, as you might say, but I'd rather say, you know, what the real situation is that we face. The real situation we face is we're putting carbon into the atmosphere 8 to 30 times faster than at any point in the last 5, 6 billion years in, in the Earth's history. And we're past the point of no return in terms of many of the tipping points. And I won't go into the details. People presumably know them. So as and when new regimes emerge over the next 10 to 20 years, they will be required to work together and invest in technologies that remove carbon from the atmosphere or put mirrors up. It's not really my patch to say what should happen. I think the key thing is there's a time limit and everyone has to totally dedicate their lives to overturning the regimes that are taking us to extinction, which is, let's not delude ourselves. We are looking at human extinction, like the death of 8 billion people. There's no way people are going to be able to survive after 5 degrees centigrade. That's what I'm trying to say, and that's what we're heading for. We take it one step at a time, don't we? But when new regimes are in power, then if we need to do geoengineering, we're going to do it. And my understanding is we'll need to do it. In many countries, and particularly in America, there are people who, for one reason or another, deny the realities that we face. 
number one is we need to stop calling it science. The word science is a word which puts many people off because science is associated with power and the power to oppress ordinary people. We need to talk about what's going to happen or say what the reality is. Second thing is we need to obviously give people the information. No one's interested in information unless it's connected to emotion and values and, and confrontation. In other words, we need to say, look, what does it mean to betray your children, your community? What does it mean to betray America? It has to be connected to where people are actually at in and of themselves. You know, I've done over 200 public talks, and it's that part of the talk where people start coming around. Yeah, they need to know that the situation is totally fucked, and they need to know what it is to be the person they are at this point in history and what it is to be responsible and a responsible adult and all the rest of it. The other thing is, no one's going to give a flying fuck, basically, until there's mass resistance. Political change definitely doesn't happen through giving information when you're dealing with entrenched power. That's the first rule of political theory, right? It just doesn't happen. Martin Luther King said that, Gandhi said that, every resistance movement knows that. There's got to be resistance in order to make change. And you need to be able to reach out to your opposition and talk in their language and say, what are you doing, you know, in terms of your own values? And I have no problems talking to right-wing populist people, Republican-Americans, bring them on, because I know what I will say, which is, why are you standing by and allowing America to be destroyed? This is not a the rich versus the poor thing, ultimately. It's the rich committing suicide, killing us first, and then killing themselves. That's what the reality is. So... There's every possibility we can build a consensus, but only after people have resisted. And obviously, it's going to take a while, but it will come. It's part of the system of creating change, which is to speak truth to power, as the phrase goes, and then to be dragged out of court. The main takeaway here is we just need to do it, right? You know, it took people in the UK like two or three years to start challenging the judges. And once we start to challenge the judges, then we were put in prison. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we need to do all around the world, right? Whenever someone says something that isn't true, like, you know, the climate isn't relevant in court, then we need to interrupt that person and say, that's simply not the case. And then when they tell us to shut up, we say, I'm not shutting up because it's my legal and moral and patriotic right to actually speak the truth. And then you talk over the judge and then the police come in and drag you out. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like the Chicago 7. You've seen that film, right? You know, it's like at a certain point, the system has no legitimacy anymore. So, you know, that's the time to do cartwheels in front of the judge, as they did in that trial. It's a whole different paradigm, right? This is not, it's not about the law. It's about power. There's absolutely no legitimate reason why you can't present a case about a massive injustice in court, right? It's nothing to do with the legal process, it's to do with the politics. And I've written a book on it as it happens, <laughs> you know, about the trial and what happened. So yeah, it's as old as the hills, isn't it? I mean, it's not the first time, and it won't be the last time that courtrooms are used to, you know, publicise the truth and have that truth uh, squashed 